Well, good morning, Thrive Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Glad to be in church. Let's give God praise. Thank you, God. So I saw some of you saw me walk in with crutches, and I really wish that that was a sermon illustration, but it's not. So a lot of people have been asking, hey, what happened to you? What happened to you? And and so I've been skiing with a buddy of mine who's here today, and I'm not going to mention Donnie's name at all because I don't want to throw him under the bus. But, uh, you know, I've been skiing with him a lot this, this past winter, and I've really been picking up my game. And Donnie, again, I'm not going to mention his name, pretty competitive person, and I think... Uh, yeah, I think he got a little bothered by how good I was getting and uh, kind of swooped down and somehow our skis got entangled and uh, no, I'm joking. No, it's, it was that last hill. I was doing great until the last hill, but uh, I love you, Donnie, man. We've been having good, good time, good connection, growing together. So I want to welcome all of you here this, this, uh, this Passion Week the week of Easter today, as Garrett mentioned, today is Palm Sunday, and I'm just excited. I'm excited about what God is going to do. I always get excited this time of year because God is up to something, and we're seeing evidence of that. We're seeing lives changed in Jesus' name. We're seeing people heal. We're seeing people set free in the ministry of Celebrate Recovery of this church. Can we just give God praise for what he is doing, what he's up to? So I'm, I want to welcome all those who are watching online this morning in the 715 area code. My name is Sheldon Miles. I'm the pastor of this great church, and we got a lot going on. Uh, I, I, as you heard in the announcements, we have this event called Extravaganza, and we are in need, okay? So uh, how many of you saw, saw the bicycles out here as you walked in today? Wasn't that awesome? It kind of looked like a motorcycle gang parked out here. Um, you know, what would, you know what would be awesome? Each of those bikes we, we, is an opportunity to bless a family. I would love, love, love to see that doubled. Can I just encourage you, challenge you, that you, would, you just maybe extend yourselves and give. Make, let, your, let your family be an opportunity to bless somebody uh, at this Easter season for that extravaganza. The second thing that we need for this event is we need some volunteers, Okay, and this is a big event. We had over 900 people here in this building last year, and we're expecting more. As a matter of fact, it's been on Facebook, and one of our neighbors has been responding that they plan to be here. And so I just want to encourage you, if you would just take that step of volunteerism today, and if you are going to volunteer, it is required. Everybody say required. It's required that you be at a quick meeting at the end of service today. So uh, if interested, you can just go ahead and sign up at the, uh, at the Connect desk and then just show up for that quick meeting today and uh, you'll hear all about it. So I just want to uh, move forward in this message in this, uh, that, that God has on our hearts this, today. Uh, and last week, I just want to point out, Garrett has been filling in and didn't he do an awesome job last week? <laughs> Garrett, I appreciate you, man. I see a lot of growth taking place in your life, man. And our intern, Zach, is doing a phenomenal job. And I just, we're investing in the next generation. That's what we're doing here. So we're in a sermon series called He Knows. He Knows. Aren't you glad that he knows what we're going through? You know, have you ever gone through a challenge in life? You ever gone through one of these, these things here that you, you didn't expect? You, you didn't see coming. Nobody, you didn't see what was going to happen to you when you went into work that one day, or you didn't, you didn't plan on that accident. You didn't plan on that breakup. You didn't plan on that divorce. But we know that life happens. And when, we, when life happens, we don't want to just talk to anybody. You know, it's the people that have been there, done that. Those are the, the kind of people that we seek out, you know, and that's why I think Celebrate Recovery is such a great program because it's, it's done, it's led by leaders who have been there, done that, and that's who we kind of seek out during those difficult times, and sometimes I think we, you know, we, we might wrestle. I know people who wrestle with, you know, what does God know? Because God's like way up there and I'm way down here. Does he even understand, does he comprehend the challenge that I'm going through? And I would want you to know this morning, he knows he knows. I, I love this passage in Hebrews, Hebrews 2.18. He says, since he himself, talking about Jesus, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, challenges, rejection, 
Because he's done that, because he's been there and he's done that, he is able to help us when we are being tested. So I want you to know, if you get anything out of this sermon series, I want you to know he knows. Jesus knows what you're going through this morning. He knows the challenges that you're facing. And not only does he know, more importantly, he cares. He cares. I love that passage in the Bible that says, cast all your cares on him. Why? Because he cares about you. I want you to know you have a God who loves you, and he cares about every single issue, incident that's going on in your life. And I want you to know this third thing. He provides He's a God who provides, and he provides answers, and he provides peace, and he provides hope, and he loves you, and he cares for you. He is there for you. He knows, he cares, and he provides. Whatever you're going through this morning, I don't know your situation, but I want you to know he knows. I want This topic I want to talk about this morning is one of the most painful experiences that all of us will face in life, all of us face it, and that is the challenge of rejection. Rejection. What is rejection? Well, let, let, let me point out rejection like this. So we, we, just about every Sunday, you're going to hear us say in our announcements or in some way, shape, or form, we say this phrase, we say, wherever you are in your faith journey, remember this? Wherever you are in your faith journey, you are welcome, you are accepted, and you are loved. And we sincerely mean that. We don't, that's just not some token phrase that we put out there. No, we want people to know. We want people that when they come in, we want to have a parking lot ministry. One of these days, we're going to have a phenomenal parking lot ministry where people are greeted as they get out of their cars on Sunday mornings. And as they're greeted by people at the front door, they get an authentic greeting. That people just shake their hands, give them a high five, give them a hug, say, we are so glad that you're here this morning. That don't you love them when you feel welcome like that? And then be accepted that wherever you are in life, here at Thrive Church, whatever is going on in life, whatever your issue, we all understand we have stuff. And this is a great place to go when you have stuff going on in your life. You are welcome. You are accepted here in this place and you are loved because this is a community of people that has discovered God's love for them and that we are called to extend love towards each other. And some of you are like, well, what does that have to do with rejection? Rejection is the opposite. Rejection is, is, the, is the feeling that you get that wherever you are in life, if you're not just right, if you're not have all your cards stacked up just right, well, then you're not welcome here. Have you ever been to a place like that? Have you ever, I hope you've never been to a church where you felt unwelcomed. Or, or you feel like, you know what, I feel like I'm not accepted here. Years ago, Michelle and I went on a sabbatical and we were visiting churches. We were visiting churches. And this church kind of prided themselves on kind of a family church. Well, we fell out what that meant. And we, so we went and sat in that, that church service and they had a greeting time and nobody, zero, nobody came up to us. And we watched how they hugged each other and they greeted each other. Nobody came up and talked and nobody greeted us at the door. And I'm so just being as cantankerous as I can get sometimes, I'm like, I am going to stay here until somebody is going to have to come up and talk to us to tell us to leave, okay? Well, eventually, a crowd exited, exited. Finally, the pastor came up and, you know, and greeted us and, and met us. But, oh, man, may Thrive Church never, ever become a church like that because this is a church that welcomes people wherever they're at in life. We accept people wherever they're at in life and we love people as Jesus loves us. Amen? 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 And so rejection is the opposite. It's the opposite. And some of you are here today and you've experienced rejection. You know what rejection is all about. You were, maybe you, you were rejected as a child. Remember being on the playground and, and, and everybody, they're picking sides. And any of you, I know I was the last play, person to be picked in that form of rejection or that that girl you had a crush on and you wrote a little note and you know, hey, do you like me? And you, get, you got the note to her and you got the note back and then she circled no. 
Or maybe you were rejected by a parent, rejected by a friend, rejected in a relationship, in a dating relationship, you know, maybe back in high school or college and you went together for the longest time and then that rejection, like, yeah, I think we need to talk. Or that George Costanza, it's not you, it's me. (laughs) Or maybe it happened in a marriage and you never saw it coming. Maybe it happened in your workplace, by your peers or by your boss. I think one of the, the most painful experiences that I've ever experienced came in the form of rejection. And this happened several years ago, serving in a church, and, uh, and, and I, was going kinda, I was going through a rough season, okay? Sometimes you go through rough seasons in life. And I think that it was beginning to show in, in our ministry. And so I was approached by the, the leaders of the church, and I was given the option that I could either step down on my own or I could take the risk of maybe them releasing me. Man, that was hard. It was hard. I, we, we, we chose to step down. And that, that rejection that we felt. And, and that stuck with me for a long time. I just, I never saw it coming. Rejection's hard. Rejection happens in life. Life is full of rejection moments. If you haven't experienced it, I'm sorry to say, but you will. It's going to happen. And so as we approach this Easter week, we reflect on Jesus, and it's so important that we grasp his humanity because he knows. We understand as we look through the scriptures, we see very clearly that he was God, but then he came to, he came to earth in the flesh. Everybody say, in the flesh, okay? And can, if you could just kind of, can you, can you just do this, do it correctly here and do it like, can you just do it to your neighbor, just, Give him just a little tug in the arm there. Just, just, just a little, just, yeah, not, not too hard. I see some of your wives are winding up. No, 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 don't, 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 just, just, just a little. Did you feel that? Did, did, how many of you, you felt just that little nudge? Okay, you, how many, raise your hand, you felt that little nudge. Okay, I want you to know, Jesus came in flesh and he would have felt that little nudge. Okay, he felt that little nudge. And he lived here on the earth for 33 years and during that time, then towards the end, he felt betrayal by some of his closest friends. And then he was rejected by many of his followers. And then he felt the excruciating pain that happened to him on the cross. You know, the, the word crucifixion, that's where they get the word excruciating. It's from the crucifixion that he experienced. You know, I, I, I think... You know, he died because he was put on a cross, but I believe there's a part of him that died from a broken heart, from a broken heart. I want you to know this morning, Jesus knows rejection. Jesus knows the rejection that you have gone through or that you are going through this morning. And it's, it's, it's even pointed out to us, the prophets tell us in Isaiah, some 700 years before the events of Easter, it's projected of what is gonna happen, that Jesus would go through rejection for you and for me. It says this in Isaiah 53, three, maybe you've heard this before. It says, talking about Jesus, 700 years before, that he was despised and he was rejected. He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with deepest grief. He turned, we turned our backs on him, because we rejected him and we looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Two two very strong words that are used in this prophecy. He was despised, that means to be loathed. Like, I don't know if you've ever loathed somebody before, but you just can't stand them. Can't stand to be around them. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, I don't wanna know. But for something, something that Jesus did, he was despised, he was hated. And he was rejected. He, re, he revealed himself as a life giver. And, and somehow that was not accepted. So my question is today, how does a follower of Jesus, how do we respond when we go through rejection? How do we respond? How many of you remember 
How many remember back in the 90s, those bracelets that people would wear, the WWJD bracelets? Remember that? Remember that? And what it, would st- what it stood for is, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And it all stemmed from this passage here in 1 Peter. It says, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. Then he says this passage right here. This is where they get the whole idea that he is your example and you must follow in his steps. And so here we are this, this week of Easter and we reflect on all that Jesus did and, and everything that he went through. And today I think I, I would change it up a little bit by a letter or two. And I would say let us this morning, let us focus on WDJD. What did Jesus do? As we face the rejection in our life, I, I ask you the question, what did Jesus do when he was in the midst of this? So we're going to focus on this this morning. And the first thing that we see, the way that Jesus responded to rejection, pain and rejection, is that he kept moving. Look at your neighbor and say, keep moving. Keep moving. Let me set the scene for you. As Garrett pointed out, today is Palm Sunday. And before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, this is just days before he's going to be taken into custody. We see Jesus moving forward. He knows what he's moving forward into. Let me say it one more time. He knows. He knows and he keeps on moving forward. Look at this here passage in Luke 18. He says, taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus said, listen, We're going up to Jerusalem where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Romans and he will be mocked, he will be treated shamefully, and he will be spit upon. They will flog him with a whip and they will kill him. But on the third day, he will rise again. Jesus is intentionally moving forward. He's moving toward his death, moving towards his crucifixion, and he knows it, but yet he still keeps moving forward. Here, here's kind of the scene in Jerusalem. This is the time of Passover. This is the great feast that is even celebrated today, and Jews from all over the world would come to Jerusalem and celebrate. It's kind of like 4th of July for us. 4th of July, we celebrate our freedom from England, all right, and this is when we, be, we earned our independence through this great fight here, and so we celebrate. Well, this is when the Jews, they celebrate their, their release, their slavery from Egypt that happened through Moses years ago. And now, though, the, Rome, or the Israelites, they, the, the Jewish people, they find themselves under Roman oppression, and all they want is their freedom, and they hated their captors. So they just wanted to be free of Rome. And so what they were looking for, and the, the scriptures talk about it, the prophecy talks about this person who would come and who would be the Messiah. And they just envisioned it. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be awesome if the Messiah showed up during Passover? And he would come in triumphantly and he would lead us into victory. He would be this superhero king that God would send to set them free from their oppression. Well, they had a hint, they had a hunch, and maybe this Jesus guy, because many of them had been witnesses to his many miracles that he had performed, and like, man, there's something about this guy. And then they get word, this Jesus guy is coming into Jerusalem. And and all the crowds begin to gather, you you remember this? All the crowds gather, and and they begin to wave these palm branches, and they would throw their cloaks on on, on the ground. And this is what, they only did this for kings back then. This is something, all of a sudden, they're welcoming a king. Let me read it to you. It says, so they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over for him to ride on. And as he ride, when he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. 
peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. I mean, this is a glorious day. Hey, everyone, the Messiah is coming. The Messiah, and we're going to be free of Roman oppression. Well, there's some good news and there's some bad news. The good news is, Yes, you called it right. Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, you, yes, yes, yes. Ding, 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 ding. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yes, he is the Messiah. The bad news is Jesus was not the Messiah that they were looking for. You see, Jesus' plan was much bigger than this. They wanted somebody to set them free from their earthly condition. Jesus had come to save them from their spiritual condition of sin. So how did, the re, how did the people respond when Jesus didn't come as they had expected? And Garrett talked about this. They rejected him. Just a few short days later, that same crowd, I mean, I had a massive crowd greeting him. And they're just like, yeah, yeah, the Messiah has come. Just a few days later, these are the same people who are in a Roman courtyard who start screaming when, when Pilate says, what should I do with this man? What should I do with this Jesus? These same people begin to shout, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Rejection. Rejection. We reject this man who claims to be the Messiah. Isn't it interesting how sometimes the same thing happens today? Have you ever known somebody who prayed for a miracle, prayed for a breakthrough, and it didn't quite happen the way that they had hoped for or had expected? Have you ever seen somebody lose their faith because God didn't answer the way that they had wanted him to? They expected him to do this and to do that. And God didn't show up in the way that they wanted. And so they lose heart and they walk away. I encourage you, church. I've seen this happen to many friends. Be careful. Be careful because God doesn't always show up in the way that we want or expect. And so, the, so Paul, the apostle, he challenges us in these moments of rejection, let's be Christ-like. When we go through rejection, he says this in, in Galatians 6, 9, and my encouragement today for all of you is this, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest, a blessing. If we don't give up, look at your neighbor and say, don't give up. I know you're hurting. I know, you, I know you're You feel rejected, don't give up. I'm gonna encourage you, church. Jesus didn't give up. He didn't give in. He kept pressing on. My encouragement to you in the midst of your rejection is don't give up. Look at your name and say, don't give up. Don't give in. Keep pressing on. Keep pressing on no matter what. In 1952, there was this woman named Florence Chadwick. And why she wanted to do this, I do not know. But she attempted to swim from the Catalina Island to the mainland of California, some 22 miles of shark-infested waters, okay? She had already swam the English Channel from England to, to France and even back, okay? So this is just something that she does, okay? And so that day, the, the weather was foggy, and it was, it was cold, and it was so foggy that, like, the accompanying boats that are with her, she could barely see the boats. And after 15 hours of swimming, she began to grow discouraged because she couldn't see the mainland. She thought, I should see the mainland by now, but because of the fog, and then she just began to get weary, not only in her body, but in her mind and in her heart. Have you ever been there before? And just like, oh, I just can't do it. And her mom is saying, we're almost there. We're almost there. Finally, just completely exhausted, mentally and physically, she, got, she called for help. She tagged out. They pulled her into the boat. And it was then that she discovered she was only, at 22 miles, she was only a half mile from the shore. But she couldn't see it. Just kind of reminds me of that, that. You ever heard that song by Danny Gokey? Just have, maybe you just haven't seen it yet. Just haven't seen it yet. You see, 
I know that in, in my season of rejection, it just, I got, I got put into a fog. And when you get into a fog, sometimes you just, you feel like you're stuck. And we can become so consumed with the pain of our rejection that we miss out on what is in front of us. And if that's you this morning, I want to encourage you to keep on moving. Keep on moving. Keep on moving. And, and you know what? Maybe this is what it means. Maybe, maybe for you to keep on moving, maybe, the, maybe what you need to do is you need to just, okay, here, here's a reality check. And maybe you just say, here is my part in the rejection. It always starts with the self-examination. Maybe I contribute. So I need to own my part of the rejection. And then I need to, number two, I need to forgive my offender and I need to keep moving forward. One step in front of the other. I've, I've run 12 marathons. You know how you run 12 marathons? You know how you do that? I can't demonstrate it for you right now. <laughs> okay. But you just take one step and then you take the other step in front of the other and the next step in front of the other. And for some of you, that's just what you need to do. Just keep moving forward. And so we see, what, what did Jesus do? He kept moving forward. Number two, I encourage you, keep on trusting. There's this part, the scene in the, in the Passion Week where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and this is hours before he's to be taken away. He knows, and yet he keeps moving forward to it. And so he's praying, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and, and, and he's asking God for strength, but he's asking God is like, you know, like we could change plans here, you know, like could, could there maybe be another way? And he's overwhelmed with anguish. And sometimes that's what a, a rejection does to us. It just, our hearts are just, oh, this hurts so bad. Jesus knows what is lying before him. Look at what it says here in Matthew, 28, or Matthew 26. They said, he told them, he, he talking to his disciples, he says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And he went on a little further and he bowed with his face to the ground praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. It's interesting, this is not in your notes, but in Luke 22, it says that he prayed more fervently and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. This is, some people have speculated there is a condition by rare, rare condition, but they've seen it in soldiers where soldiers are about to go into battle and they're so anxious that, to face this battle. Have you ever been that place before? That they will actually sweat blood. It's a rare condition, but some people do it. And that's what they think was happening with Jesus. He was just, oh, this anguish that I feel, this heaviness in my heart. Jesus could have looked at God's plan. Is it really? This, this is the plan you have for me? He could have looked at God's plan and said, what? this plan is rejection. Well, God, why are you rejecting me? You're gonna put me through this? And he could have looked at God's plan and say, this is rejection. Who would, who would do that to their own child? Who would put their child through anguish like this? But Jesus, this was the ultimate test of trusting God. Because Jesus responds, look at the last part of this, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Trust. Even when I don't feel it, even when I don't see it, I don't understand it, I don't like it, I don't want it. Have you ever been there? Still, I will follow. God, I trust your will over mine. I trust your will. I trust that you know my pain. Years ago, our son was, uh, got a, got a, a rare sickness, and he had this terrible swelling that went to his knees as part of the sickness, his response to this. And he's just, I don't know, eight or nine years old, okay? And he's just in pain and agony. And the doctor said, we are gonna have to tap his knees. Does anybody know what that means? I don't wanna tell you anymore what that means. But we're gonna have to take a large needle and we're gonna have to insert it into his kneecap so that we can drain this fluid Tap 
my knees, <laughs> not my son. The doctor said, listen, we're gonna give him, and we're like, just give him a drug that he won't feel. He's like, no, we need to do this right now. We are gonna give him a drug, and he's not going to remember this. And so we're thinking, we're thinking, okay. And, 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 and the doctor said, trust us, we know what we're doing. So we are there with him and we are in charge of helping to hold down our son as they tap his knees. Oh. And he is screaming and he is looking at us and he said, you promised this wouldn't hurt. And he's saying, oh, I'm like, oh, the pain. And I'm like, give me a drug that I don't remember this. And I got, like, and I'm just mad. I'm furious at the doctor. Like, you, you promised us this is going to be all right. You promised us. And he's, trust me. Hour or so later, he doesn't remember a thing. He's playing video games. I ask him today, Ty, do you ever remember that incident? I remember being at the hospital and eating ice cream, playing video games. <sighs> trust us. I had to trust the doctor. I had to trust him that he knew what he was doing. I had to trust his will over mine. So in the midst of rejection, we see that Jesus kept moving. I'm almost finished here. He kept trusting. And then last of all, we see that Jesus kept loving. Kept loving. You see, after sentencing Jesus to be crucified, the guards took him. And we know the story, that, and they began to start to beat him, and they began to pull at his beard, and they were laughing at him. And then they, they took him to this horrible scourging post, and they whipped him, just like the prophecy said, and they whipped him horribly. They scourged him. They placed a crown of thorns on him, and they mocked him. And, they, and then they made him march naked through the streets just to humiliate him. And as the people, the same people who just who, who greeted him just a few days earlier are now spitting at him and mocking at him as he goes through the streets. Talk about rejection. And it says here in Luke 23, it says that when they came to the place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, listen to this. They have just put him now, he's, he's up in position, he's up on the cross. And these are the words that come out of his mouth. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. You see, he did the greatest thing that anyone could do on a cross. He forgave. He forgave his betrayers, he forgave his rejectors, he forgave his persecutors, he forgave you, he forgave me, he forgave all mankind. In the midst of his greatest horror and agony, he was thinking of others. He was thinking of you. First John 4.10 says this, this is real love. Not that we love God, but he loved us. And he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. He, he took our place. That's what he did. He took our place. That's what true love does. True love is to give yourself to the benefit of others. I heard this story just really grabbed my heart the other week. There was this man in Missouri, and he was suffering from a kidney disease. And the only solution was a transplant. That, that needed to happen. And he, because he was just living on and off a dialysis machine. And so his daughter urged him to, to let her donate her kidney. And he said, no, absolutely no. You're too young and you, you got a long time to live here. No, I will not allow yourself to do it. Well, one of the reasons for that, why he was so adamant is 16 years earlier, he had lost his son to cancer and he could not bear to lose his daughter. But his daughter was persistent. How many of you got persistent daughters? Okay. And she went along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And behind his back began to pursue the process of donating her kidney to her father. She, this is what she told the reporter. She said, I didn't care how mad he would be with me. I don't care if he kicks me out of the house or hates me or doesn't say a word to me for the rest of my life. At least he'll be living a good life and not hooked up to a machine. 
So the doctors came in and told him, say, we got some good news. We have a match, all right, and we're gonna be performing the surgery. So they moved forward with the transplant surgery. When he woke up the next day, he realized that his daughter was the one who had donated her. She walked into the room. Here's a picture of what it looked like. Do we have that picture? He looked at her and said, I knew you were up to something. (laughs) And all he could do was weep because of the love of this daughter. This daughter risked her life for her dad because that's what love does. And that's what Jesus did for us. He gave of himself. He gave of himself. He went through rejection. He went through excruciating pain for you. Jesus tells us then to us, how do we respond like Jesus? Jesus said, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for their friends. So I challenge you this morning, even if in the midst of your rejection, in the midst of your pain, I challenge you with this thing called grace. Grace is to give to those who don't deserve it a pass. Is to give them acceptance. Is to give them love. Let me ask you this morning, as I close out this message, who has rejected or hurt you? Right now, the image of that person is just flashing in your mind. Bang, it's right there. Who no longer deserves your love or deserves your grace? That picture is still there. Who do you need to forgive today? Who do you need to extend grace to today? See, Jesus knows rejection. <laughs> Rejection's not hard, but it's, it's going to happen. If that's you this morning, I, I want to give you this challenge. I want to challenge you. Let's do what Jesus did. Let's keep moving. Let's keep trusting. Even when we don't see it, I would trust. Let's keep loving through forgiveness. I'm going to pray for the rejected here this morning. Maybe that rejection happened years ago. Maybe it just happened this morning. I want to pray for you because that's a painful experience. But I want you to know he knows. He knows. And he will give you the strength. And he will give you what you need to get through it. But what if we just did what Jesus did? So I want to pray for you this morning in Jesus' name. All around this room, people experience rejection, the hurt of rejection. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and speak to them today. And Lord, you would give them the strength to keep on moving, even if it's just one step in front of the other. I pray that in the midst of this, even though they don't understand how it happened or why it happened, you would help them to keep their eyes on you and keep trusting. I pray, Father, that you would give them a love that's not of their own. It would help them to forgive like you forgave us. In Jesus' name. If you're here this morning, maybe you don't know this Jesus that I was just talking about this morning. But I want you to know, he wants to know you and he wants to live in relationship with you. And so if you, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus this morning, you like to do that. It's as easy as this. Just pray with me. Just say, God, I need you. And I'm inviting this God of love who knows my pain and rejection. I'm inviting him to come and live inside of me, to forgive me, to change me from the inside out. I am choosing today to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray.